Good morning, Hillcrest. It's nice to see you in-house, and those of you that are online, welcome. Uh, my name is Chris Trinan, and I'm on staff here at Hillcrest, and it's my pleasure to get to read to you uh, our scripture reading for today. It's coming at us uh, out of Paul's famous book of Romans. Uh, we're in chapter 10, and we're reading verses 9 through 15. Here we go. He says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. Thank you for reading the word of the Lord this morning, uh, Pastor Chris. It's my privilege this morning to introduce our speaker. And uh, Jess Weiberg moved uh, to Moose Jaw in 2012. He left his role at, in marketing at WestJet, and he came to work at Joe's Place Youth Center here in Moose Jaw. And then he served there for a number of years, and he now does voiceovers. He's, so if you see a commercial on TV, you might uh, hear his Nice voice resounding in the background, uh, and uh, maybe that'll be familiar to you today when you hear him speak today. But uh, the reason we've asked him to speak today is because God's been doing a work in his heart in a very important area, and that's the area of learning to share our faith with others. And so we wanted to have him come, share what God's been doing with him, and also help us to get started on a whole new growth curve, hopefully, for our church, a whole new growth curve in being able to share our faith effectively. So, would you give a great big welcome for Jess Weiber? Thanks, Steve. Thank you, everybody. Um, I had an excuse this morning if I messed up. It's my first time preaching. This is my second time, so please still be gentle. Um, we're going to start with the Kahoot survey, everybody's favorite part of the sermon, potentially, today. Uh, so Kahoot.it, and there's the code, you can see it. I'm going to join in too. Kahoot.it, and the pin is 524-9325, 524 and you get to pick your name, 9325, enter. All right. Once everybody's in there, we'll jump into the first question. And if you're online, you can join in too. Uh, don't forget that you can answer as well, even if you're home. You can participate. So, we should be getting pretty close to having everybody in there. I think, I hope. Technical difficulties. Who has the goofiest name? The numbers? It's not letting the numbers go in? What do we want to do, Kurt? Cam? Nine, eight, two? He forgot the rest. <laughs> Nine, eight, two, zero, two, seven, seven. There we go. I am awesome meerkat. Awesome meerkat. Okay, we'll let everybody get in there. And then we'll start the survey. Who's looking forward to more warm weather this week? Yes. It's been so nice, although this morning was a little cold, but... All right. Everybody in? Ready? Okay. We're ready, guys. Here we go. First question. Who said it? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations and go into the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
Was it Paul, Peter, Jesus, or Moses? Who said it? Mine's still loading. Oh, there we go. Still, is everybody, did it, did it work for everybody? Okay, there we go. All right. Now I can't tell. Okay, there it is. All right, I'm going to answer too. So who said it? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations and go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Paul, Peter, Jesus, or Moses. Do we have the results? Drum roll. There we go. The results say that 34 of you say it was Jesus. Good job. It was Jesus. Those of you that guessed Paul or Moses, you can leave. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, next question. I believe heaven and hell are real and that a person's relationship with Jesus determines where they spend eternity. I believe heaven and hell are real and that a person's relationship with Jesus determines where they spend eternity. You can strongly agree with that, agree somewhat with it, disagree or strongly disagree. Where do you land on that question? It's an important one. Where do you land? Oh, I said that was quick. That was fast on the, on the draw on that one. So I believe heaven and hell are real. All right, 28 of you say you strongly agree, seven agree, one disagrees, four strongly disagree. All right, that's interesting, and thank you guys for being honest. Question three. I believe that sharing my faith, the good news of Jesus Christ with non-Christians, is one of the most important things I can do as a Christian. Again, do you strongly agree with that, agree Disagree or strongly disagree? I believe that sharing my faith, the good news of Jesus Christ with non-Christians, is one of the most important things I can do as a Christian. Strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. Where do you land on that one? All right, we've got the results. All right, the majority strongly agree or agree, and there's a few that disagree. Again, thank you guys for being honest. Question four. The last time I verbally shared the good news with a non-Christian was in the last few weeks. It's been a month plus. It's been a year plus where I have never verbally shared the good news. So the last time you verbally, out of your mouth, shared the good news, your faith with a non-Christian was in the last few weeks, it's been a month or more, a year or more, or I've never actually shared it verbally. Where do you land on that one? All right, we got the results on that. Okay, awesome. Some of you have been sharing in the last few weeks. That's great. Last month, that's great. Last year, awesome. None of you have never shared. That's awesome. I love that. Great. Okay, next question. My biggest obstacle in sharing the good news is I don't want to offend or annoy people. I don't really know how. I'm really shy or I don't understand it myself. So what's the biggest obstacle to you in sharing your faith, the good news? I don't want to offend or annoy people. I don't know how. I'm really shy. I don't understand it myself. What stops us? Let's see what we got. The results are pouring in. And the results are? I don't, the, the majority say I don't want to offend or annoy people, or I'm really shy, and then some are feeling like they don't know how, or they don't understand it themselves. Awesome. Thank you guys for your honesty in Kahoot today. Um, Saturday mornings in 1986 were amazing for six-year-old me. Because you'd get up, you'd grab a bowl of cereal, you'd run to the TV, and you'd watch things like Transformers, or G.I. Joe, Thundercats, Inspector Gadget, 
And although I'd never admit it to my friends at school, Care Bears. <laughs> I actually had a stuffed Swift Heart Rabbit, the, the blue rabbit there. I had a, a stuffy of him for a long, long time, and I loved it. Tash made me get rid of it last year. <laughs> I was going to school. I was in grade one out in Cairnport. That's my grade one picture. I'm in the middle there with the yellow kind of sweater top, and I have my eyes closed for some reason. I, this particular Saturday morning, I was at Jeremy's house. Jeremy's in the top left wearing the Canucks jersey. And Jeremy was a guy I really looked up to. Um, he, I would call him my best friend. And I loved hanging out with Jeremy. He was cool. He was a good athlete. He was just a guy that you wanted to be around. And so I really looked up to Jeremy. And I liked hanging out with him. So we were watching cartoons at his place Saturday morning. Just a great morning. Watch the cartoons. And then one of Jeremy's other friends came over. I didn't know him all that well. And we're just going to call him Steve for the sake of calling him Steve. It's not Pastor Steve, if that's what you're thinking. But So Steve came over and kind of messed up the, the dynamic that me and Jeremy had where we were getting along and having a good time. Jeremy and Steve started kind of getting along a little better. And I became jealous. I became frustrated. And so I kind of started creating some friction between us. And we got into a fight. And I said some things that weren't true. I tried to lie about myself and make myself sound better. And they saw right through it. And they were like, you're not. That's a lie. I'm like, you don't even know. And then I ended up going home really, really mad. I was walking home, this little six-year-old, you know, just kicking stones on the way home and was really frustrated, hoping to get home and, you know, maybe take out some of that frustration on my little brother or just get a hug from mom or dad and just go home and, and be comforted. So I walk in the door, and the first thing I hear is, Jesse, you didn't clean your room. Go clean your room. I was supposed to clean my room that morning, and I didn't. I can't remember if I forgot or I just disobeyed. I probably just wanted to go watch cartoons. Um, And so this is is great. I'm angry. I'm grumpy. Fight with my friends. I, I lied. I'm jealous. Now I'm in trouble. I disobeyed. So I walk into my room, head down. You know, I'm going to clean my room by kicking my toys into the toy, toy bin. And I'm like, I start looking around, and all the toys, are, there's nothing on the floor. Like, there was some Lego there. My Care Bear Gitchies were there earlier. They're gone. And I look up, and what do I see in my clean room? A brand new, to me, dirt bike. Now, I loved dirt bikes. We never had much money growing up. Dad was a college student. Mom worked part-time. We didn't have the money to afford this. And yet somehow they had scraped money together and sacrificed and got me a dirt bike. I was blown away. My dad was sitting across the room beaming, just so excited. I think he was more excited to give it to me than I actually was to get it. And I was really excited to get it. So I ran over and gave him a big hug and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. My mom wasn't quite as excited about a six-year-old having a dirt bike. She was a little worried I might get hurt, but, you know, I didn't until like three days later when I sprained my ankle really bad going off a jump. But um, my dad was so excited to give me this gift that I had done nothing to deserve. I hadn't worked for it. I hadn't like promised I would clean up my room and do these chores to get it. He just gave it to me out of the goodness of his heart, out of the joy that he had to see me be happy. So we took the bike out. Dad taught me how to start it with a kick starter and how to use the gas and the brakes. Don't squeeze too hard on that front brake or you'll... I learned that the hard way, actually. Um, but he showed me the rules of the road, the rules of the bike, and I was happy to follow those rules, what he told me to do, because I didn't want to wreck the bike. I didn't want to get hit by a car. I didn't want to hit anybody's property. I was happy to obey because of this amazing gift that I had. And I wanted more than anything to go share it with my friends. I wanted to take that bike, and the first place I went after I asked Dad if I could, I took it to Jeremy's house. And I completely forgot about the fight that we had had earlier. And when they saw the bike, they completely forgot about the fight we had earlier. And I took them for rides, and I showed them how to ride it. This was early 80s, remember, so it's a little less safe than it is now. Um, But I wanted all my friends to get their own dirt bike. I had envisioned us like, ripping around Cairnport, this little six-year-old gang of dirt bikers, like jumping cars and, you know, going over Barkman Hill and all these things. I was so excited to share this with my friends. So why do I tell this story? Well, 
If you've been following along in the Believe series, we're on chapter 20, and it's all about sharing our faith. Why do we share our faith? So the key idea is that we share our faith with others to fulfill God's purposes. Now, what do I mean by faith? I just want to clarify what I mean by faith. So faith can often be called the good news or the gospel, and it's really our trust in Jesus. Our trust that Jesus is our Savior, not our own good deeds, not our own good works, but Jesus is the one that saves us. He came and paid the fine. We'll talk about that more. And what I, I wanted to find real quick, God's purposes. What do we mean by God's purposes? Well, in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, Peter says, he, talking about God, does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. And in Luke 12, 32, Jesus said, so don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Just like it gave my dad great happiness to give me that dirt bike, it gives our father, God, great happiness to give us his kingdom. The key verse uh, Chris read earlier in Ephesians 6, verse 19 to 20, this is Paul talking to the Ephesians. He says, Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. He's asking for prayer that when the time comes, he'll, he will clearly explain the gospel to people so that they understand, they grasp it. So how do we share our faith and with who? The Believe series uh, outlines it. It talks about two ways that we share our faith and one people group that we share our faith with. So the first way we share our faith is through our lives, right? The way we live, the way we act, in front of others, the way we treat people, the way we respond to crisis, the way we respond to blessing, those are ways that we can actually show the gospel through our lives. The second way is through our words. We actually have to verbally communicate the gospel. We have to explain the mystery, like Paul says. They're kind of like two wings on a bird, right? I don't know if any of you have ever seen a one-winged bird, bird try to fly. Um, I haven't, but I can imagine it would look pretty goofy, you know, trying to take off with one wing. It's not going to get very far. It's not going to do what it was designed to do. So if we're only sharing the gospel through the way we live and never actually verbally communicating the mystery of the gospel, we are running around with one wing trying to take off and we're not going to get anywhere. The other side, if we're only sharing it through our words and not living it, we're going to be hypocrites, right? And we're going to be trying to fly with this wing, and it's not going to go. We're, we're not going to be able to soar the way we're designed when it comes to sharing the gospel. So we need to be doing both of these things. Our lives and our words have to preach the gospel. Now, the people group that we share it with is very exclusive. <laughs> it's everybody, right? In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the, the world, right, that he gave his only son. So, are you in the world? Do you breathe air? Do other people, anybody that's on this planet needs to hear the message of the gospel, right? So the gospel is for everyone. Um, sometimes rhymes help me remember things a little better. So I came up with this rhyme. In the earlier service, my dad was here, and I had bounced this off of him because, um, again, I'm first time preaching. I want to kind of get some feedback. And he's like, he's like, hey, that rhyme's great. You know what you should do? You should rap it. And I was like, what do you mean? And he wrapped it for me. He got beat going and he wrapped it. My dad's 65 years old. Um, so I called him up this morning to wrap it. He didn't come up. So he's not here today, but we'll, uh, we'll just say it. So the good news is meant to be shown so the Savior may be known. It's meant to be spoken to save a world that's broken. It's meant to be shared with all so the lost may hear his call. So shown and known, that's our lives, how we live spoken to the broken, that's our words, and with all to hear his call, that's everybody. If you're like me, and someone says, hey, I want you to do this, and here's how you do it, my first question is why. Give me the why behind something, right? If I understand the why, the how and the what becomes a lot easier. So my goal today is to take us through the why we share our faith, not just the how. Um, it's kind of like Christmas in a weekend or Voltage, right? These big events that we do here at Hillcrest um, to hear, you know, if I told you like, hey, I want you to put in 
40 hours volunteer time, you're going to have to stand outside in the cold, or you're going to be in this, this room with a bunch of smelly, sweaty teens, you know, and you can't go home till 8 a.m. You might be like, no, thank you, not interested. But to hear someone like Joe explain the why behind Voltage, um, that, you know, we give teens a safe place to come celebrate, safe and fun place to come celebrate New Year's, to get them away from the drugs and the alcohol, that starts to make sense. Right? You're like, okay, yeah, I could get behind that. And then when he goes even deeper and says, to quote him, he says, it's to show the hope and love of Jesus to the teens of this city. And that was the same goal of the Christmas in a weekend, right? When you hear that, when you hear the why, it's like, okay, yeah, I understand why I would put in this time and effort. So I really want to hit on the why we share our faith more so than the how, because if we get the why of sharing our faith, I think the how will come a whole lot easier. So today, I'm going to suggest that there's three reasons why we share our faith. The first is appreciation. Appreciation for the gift we've been given. Just like that motorbike that I got, that I appreciated, that I realized the value of, I was excited about that, and I wanted to share it with my friends. The second is obedience, because our king tells us to, right? God tells us to share the good news. And the third is love. Love for our God and love for our fellow man. So appreciation, first things first, we need to understand that God is the good judge. All over the Bible, it talks about God being a good judge. So what does that mean for us? Well, it's actually kind of some bad news to start. Um, Real quick, if I came up to you and I said, hey, here's some medicine, you're sick, take it, you'll live, you'd be like, okay, crazy guy. Thanks for the medicine. And then you might walk away and, and, you know, you'd never do anything with it. You'd think I was nuts. But if I said, hey, I'm a doctor. I'm not, but just pretend. I'm a doctor, and I can see that you have these symptoms. And you're really actually sick, and you don't even know it. And you might die, but here's some medicine that will help you. Then you might be like, oh, awesome. Give me that medicine. Right? So we need to actually understand and hear the bad news before the good news really makes sense. So the bad news is, we are orphans who stand guilty in front of the good judge. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Every single one of us has broken God's moral law somewhere. Right? The Ten Commandments, every single one of us If we've broken even just one but kept the rest, we're guilty of breaking them all. That's what the Bible says. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. The wages, what we've earned, our sin has earned us death. And what is death? It's a word we don't talk about much, but it's hell. It's eternity without God, right? Our sin has earned us hell. You know who talked about hell a lot? Jesus. In Matthew 10, 28, he says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Who is he talking about in that second sentence? It's his father, right? It's God. Fear God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So God is the good judge We are orphaned and we stand guilty in front of him. That's the bad news. It's a terrible place to stand. Here's the good news. We stand guilty, but Jesus came and paid our fine. He came and died for us and took our place, right, so that we can be made right with God. It's an amazing, amazing gift. Let's look at those verses that we just looked at that talked about our wages and hell. Here's Jesus again in Matthew 10, 28. He says, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. But then look at what he keeps saying. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. We are valuable to the Father. He loves us. That's good news. 
We looked at Romans 6.23, the beginning of it. For the wages of sin is death. We've earned hell. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's good news. We looked at Romans 3.23. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. But look what he says after that. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. That's good news. Later on in Romans, it says, God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. He's the good judge. He can't just forgive the sins. If, if we had a judge in the earthly court systems and a criminal came up and said, yeah, I'm guilty of all this, but judge, I've heard you're loving and forgiving. You can let me go, right? What would we think of a judge that let that criminal go? He'd be corrupt. He wouldn't be a judge very long. God is fair and just. And so there had to be a payment for our sin. And that's Jesus. And that is good news. So we're guilty. We stand orphaned and guilty in front of the king. And the punishment is hell. The good news is our fine has been paid. That's such good news. We've been made right with the judge. And not only have we been made right with the judge, he then adopts us. He adopts us as sons and daughters. And he says, everything I have is yours. That's amazing news. We get eternity with our king, right? We get him now in this life, and then the promise of eternity is so exciting. But I think sometimes, if you're like me, in the past, I used to have a view of heaven or eternity as, as kind of a better alternative to hell, right? It's like, well, I don't want to go to hell, so heaven would be better. But the thought of, like, you know, the, the common image of, you know, us sitting on clouds and strumming a harp, um, that's not all that exciting. I don't want to do that for eternity. Or the thought of, you know, a, a never-ending worship service. No offense to Kurt and the crew, they did awesome today, but I, I don't know if I could do an eternal worship service. I, that's not how I'm wired. I want to worship God in other ways. So it's kind of like if I had walked into that bedroom as a six-year-old and, you know, kicking my toys, there were no toys, it was clean, but if I looked up and instead of a motorbike, there was a new wool sweater. And my dad's like, hey, I got you this wool sweater. I'm like, oh, thanks. He's like, yeah, you, you should go share it with your friends. <laughs> Be like, okay. I guess it's better than, you know, being grounded for disobeying. So then I'd put on this wool sweater. It's itchy and, you know, it always itched right here for me for some reason. And I'd go to my friends and I'd be like, hey, guys, you like my sweater? They're like, yeah, it's a cool sweater. I'm like, yeah, you should get one. I'm not excited about the gift. I'm not, they're not seeing joy in that. So if we have, if you have a, a, a wool sweater view of eternity, a wool sweater view of heaven. There's a book that I read several years ago that really kind of just switched my view of eternity and heaven, put it on its head. And it's called, oddly enough, Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Um, it's an amazing book, and that's not my review, by the way. People, my kids afterwards were like, Did you was that your review? That you're? No. Lots of people have read this book, and it's shifted their view on eternity, and it's made eternity exciting. And it just helps you appreciate the gift of eternity with God a whole lot more. So if you have a wool sweater version of heaven, I'd encourage you to, to look into this book. Um, this is a longer book, but they also have like a devotional one, and they also have it on audiobook. So yeah, look into that if, if eternity doesn't excite you. I don't have a death wish, but man, am I ready to go whenever he calls, because I'm really looking forward to it. Bart Ojima's funeral was yesterday, and I watched it online, and there was moments of sadness, but there was so much joy in knowing where he was, right? It, this godly man had gone home, and, and reading this book, diving into the Bible, figuring out where he is, what he's experiencing, I was tearing up yesterday, and I, don't, I hardly knew Bart, but I was tearing up imagining this man of God who had his faith and trust in Jesus being with Jesus. 
So if we appreciate the gift, if we appreciate what we've been given, if we get a better understanding of the gift we have, obedience can sometimes just come naturally out of that, right? So the gift that I had, the bike, um, when my dad taught me the rules, I naturally wanted to obey. I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to crash my bike. I want to learn how to do it properly. I want to be able to give my friends rides safely. The appreciation for the gift made me obey. It was quite easy. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He's called us to go and share our faith. So when I had my bike, like I said, it was easy to go around to my friends, share it with them. You know, it was exciting. It was, it was really easy. We ripped around Cairnport. It was a lot of fun. But what do we do on days where we don't appreciate the gift? Because I'll admit it, there's days where I, I'm not thinking eternally. And there's not an excitement in my heart. And it's hard, to, it's hard to stir up sometimes. So what do we do on those days? There's another thing we don't talk about very much, and it's the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's, I, w- I want to show you a, a screen here. Don't try to read it. There's too much on this screen. It's not meant for you to read. It's just meant to show you a few things. So all throughout the Bible, the, it talks about the fear of God. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the fountain of life. God is merciful to those who fear him. The church, the early church, grew through the fear of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. It's all over the Bible. See, my father, growing up, I loved him, and I knew he loved me. I had a great dad. I still do. I knew he loved me, and I loved him. There was no doubt about it. But... I also had a healthy level of fear of my father, a healthy level of respect. Because I knew if I stepped out of line, if I was doing something that was going to harm me or somebody else, or develop bad habits, my dad, out of love, would discipline me. Right? He would step in and say, no, that's not acceptable. You're in trouble. I never doubted the love of my father. I don't doubt the love of God. And the crazy thing is, I think the more we fear God, the more we understand how powerful, how he's everywhere, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's all-seeing, he could wipe us off the face of the earth in an instant and no one could say anything because he's the creator. We're his. The whole planet is his. We have a God like that, and yet we have a God of love. And he found a way to show us that love right, to save us. The cross, we don't talk about, um, we talk about his love, his mercy, and his grace a lot, right? And we should. We should celebrate that, absolutely. We don't necessarily talk about his justice, his righteousness, his holiness, his jealousy, his wrath. These are all attributes of God. And I think sometimes we avoid these because we maybe feel they contradict these, but they don't. They actually live in perfect harmony, and the cross is the perfect example of that, right? God is the good judge, And so his sense of justice could not just be pushed aside. So on that cross, his justice met his love, his mercy, and his grace. That's an amazing gift. So I would encourage you, on the days where you you don't feel like obeying, whether it's sharing your faith or anything, any sin that is, is bugging you, sometimes the fear of God can be the kick in the butt we need to do what we're supposed to do. So, if we appreciate the gift that we've been given, it can naturally move us to obedience, and on the days where we don't feel like being obedient, a little bit of the fear of God can give us the kick that we need. It moves us to love. So, out of love, as our fear of God grows, our love for him grows, and out of love for God and our fellow man, we share the good news. If you think a six-year-old on a dirt bike is scary for a mom, throw your three-year-old brother on the back of it, and drive around and see how she reacts. That's my little brother on the back. I loved him. He's my brother. He was easy to love. Um, One of the best memories of my life was driving around with him and just hearing this little guy giggling on the back as we'd go over bumps and stuff. You know, it was just great memories. As I got older, I had a a sister when I was 10. And um, as I got older, I kind of upgraded my motorbike and I used to take her for rides. And it was, it was just some of the best 
times ever. Like, I remember her laughing and giggling on the front as we drove around, and it was just so good. It, was, it came so naturally to share the gift that I'd been given with those that I loved, right? And I think we could identify with that. We have people that we love, and we naturally want them to know the Lord, right? We naturally want to share our faith with them. Sometimes it's not always easy, but we, we do. That comes naturally. But what do you do when you don't have love for them or for somebody else in your life? Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is not a suggestion. Jesus isn't saying, you know, I think it might be a good idea if you guys tried loving each other. Try it, see if it works. If not, no worries. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. See, love is a decision. Like is an emotion, right? If you get two little kids fighting, two siblings fighting, and you say, you break them up, and you figure out what's going on, and you talk it through, and then you say, okay, now, Johnny, you tell Sally that you're sorry and that you love her, and Sally, you do the same thing. What do they do? It's like, I'm sorry, love you. You know, it's not genuine. They're not feeling love at that moment. But they have to make that decision to love each other. Love is a decision. Jesus, before he went to the cross, he was praying in the garden. He's talking to the disciples here before he prays. He says, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And then going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I think that's the emotion that he's feeling inside, right? He's saying, God, if there's any other way, I would appreciate it. Like, let this pass from me. But then out of love for his father and obedience to his father and out of love for us, he says, yet not as I will, but as you will. Do we have that kind of love for people? The golden rule, Jesus said, do to others whatever you'd like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that's taught in the law and the prophets. Who of us who have faith in Jesus, if we didn't, and we were headed for hell, who of us would not want someone to come into our lives and encourage us, challenge us, share the truth with us, and to keep trying until we get it? I would want somebody to do that. I would want somebody to share with me, even if I was a little hard to get through at first. So imagine it this way. It's uh, end of summer, and your, uh, your very rich friends, from the look of it, with the backyard pool, call you over and say, hey, look, tomorrow's the last day we're keeping the water in the pool. Come on over today. We're going to go for a last swim. It's been a cold week. No sun. It's breezy. It's drizzly. It's not a good day to swim. You get there. You know, you take your towel off, and you're standing at the edge, and you're like, oh, this is going to be cold. And your friend comes and cannonballs in, right? And big splash, and you get hit, and you're like, ah. Oh, that stings. And you know that it's going to sting a whole lot more when you're in the water. And then your friend comes up and they're like, oh, it's okay if you just keep your shoulders below the water line. You know, like, complete lie. They're like actually drowning almost. You stand at the edge and you debate in your head. You're like, man, this is going to be really uncomfortable. This is not going to feel good. This is going to sting. Why would I want to put myself in that position? This is, this is silly. No, I'm not doing it. And you back up and you sit down you put your towel over your shoulders and you steal your buddy's towel because he's the goof in the pool and you wrap your legs up and you try to warm up. You don't jump in. A few minutes later, a little toddler comes around the corner, ripping around. They trip, they fall into the deep end of the pool and they sink like a rock to the bottom. Do you stop and think, that water's going to sting. That's going to be uncomfortable. That's going to be awkward. I'm going to be all wet and cold after. No, right? You immediately, all your concerns about yourself go out the window, and you jump in, you dive down, you grab that child, you pull him up to safety. So what's changed? What changed between the first scenario and the second scenario? It's love, right? Your love for that kid, your desire for them not to die, not to drown. Your love for them has caused you to totally disregard your own comfort, totally disregard that it might be a little awkward jumping in there. Your love for them has made all the difference. 
See, the key to reaching those who are perishing in their sins is love. Perfect love, it casts out all fear. If you're afraid to share your faith, don't pray for less fear, pray for more love. See, the amazing thing too to me is that this is what Jesus did for us. We're the toddler. We were sinking. We were going to hit the bottom and drown. Jesus came down, got rid of all his, gave up all his comfort, all his, you know, the glory of heaven, came down, dived into that cold water, and pulled us up and put us on the edge. Jesus did that for us. Remember in John 13, 34, he said, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. How did Jesus love us? Sacrificially, right? He gave up everything for us. Everything. Are we willing to sacrifice a little bit of comfort to go reach and save the lost? So why do we share our faith? It's out of appreciation for the gift that we've been given. It's out of obedience to our king because he tells us to. And it's out of love for our king and love for our fellow man. When we realize the amazing gift that we've been given. When we realize that our king has asked us to share it. When we realize that people will spend eternity in hell apart from God if they don't know him. Then we realize that the most caring thing, the most loving thing we could ever do is to share our faith, the good news, the gospel. So what do we do? Well, the obvious answer is, go share your faith, right? Go share your faith. This is a, a, just a little prayer that I would love it if we all wrote this down or memorized it and put a name of a person that you know God's put on your heart that you're supposed to share the gospel with. Lord, give me the appreciation, obedience, and love to share the good news with blank this week through my life and my words. So who is that person for you? Who's that person on your heart? Is it a family member, a coworker? Who is it? Now, quick question. When you think of that person and you think of actually sharing the gospel this week, did a little sense of fear or anxiety jump up in you? Because it did for me right? What are they going to think? What if I annoy them? What if they ask tough questions? What if I don't do it right? If you feel like that, I totally understand. But I have some really exciting news that I want to share with you right now that I'm super, super pumped about. And we're going to show you a video right now. So as Christians, we all know Jesus told us to go and make disciples of all nations and to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, right? The problem is, we're not really doing that. According to studies, most of us agree that we're supposed to share the gospel, but few of us do. So why is that? What's stopping us from sharing the best news we could ever share while people around us perish? While there may be a few reasons, one of the biggest is fear. Fear of making a fool of ourselves, fear of annoying or offending people, fear of not sharing clearly, or maybe the thought, I don't even know if I fully understand the gospel. How can I share something I haven't completely grasped myself? If you can identify with some of those fears, but deep down, out of appreciation, obedience, and love, you want to share the good news of Jesus Christ to the lost and broken world around you, we've got some good news. We're offering training on how to share your faith. Sign up and learn how to overcome the fears that stop you from sharing the gospel. Learn how to share clearly, effectively, simply, and most importantly, biblically. Awesome, right? We're calling it Fling Training. Want to know why it's called that? Well, tough. You're going to have to sign up to find that out. And that's mainly because Pastor Steve told us this video had to be under two minutes long. Join us and learn how to share the gospel as we let love swallow our fears and as we shine like never before. There's a city out there that needs Jesus. Let's go get him. So, 
Sling training. Training on how to share your faith simply, effectively, clearly, and biblically. I'm so excited for this. I actually have gone through this training, and um, it's totally shifted my view of sharing my faith. And it's made it so that when the time comes to share my faith, whether it's with a stranger or whether it's with somebody I've known my whole life, when the time comes to verbally share the good news, this training has been transformative and so helpful in my life. And I would encourage you, if you want to, to share your faith and want to learn how, want, to help, want help overcoming the fear, then sign up, join us. Uh, it's at Hillcrest. Uh, oh, I should go to that slide. It's, uh, go to hillcrestmj.com slash sling training. It's starting mid-March uh, the 18th. It's uh, Thursdays at 7 p.m. We're going to do it online and in person, and I would love to see you there. Guys, like the video said, there's a city out there that needs Jesus. I don't know if you've heard about this pandemic that's going on, but it's pretty serious, and a lot of people are thinking about death, right? There's a lot of people concerned about death right now. Where do they go? What happens? There's people that are hungry for this. So let's go get them, right? We have friends, we have family, we have coworkers who need Jesus, who are going to spend eternity in hell without him. Let's not forget that. Let's not just brush that aside. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful and ready, but that the workers are few. The city is a harvest that's ready. Jesus said to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Let's pray for those workers. Let's ask for workers to go out into the harvest, and let's be the workers that go out into the harvest. Romans 10, 13 to 15 we're going to say it again. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the amazing gift you've given us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that our fine has been paid and that we stand guiltless in front of you because of him. Thank you that you've adopted us as sons and daughters and that the kingdom is ours. Thank you for the promise of eternity with you. Would you give us the appreciation for the gift, the obedience to you, and the love for you and for others that drives us to share our faith? I ask and pray this in the name, power, and authority of Jesus Christ. Amen.